Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and get started with our afternoon segment. Um, you can continue um, enjoying your lunch, but we'd like you to just kind of focus your attention to the front um, for our speakers this afternoon. Um, we have a really great um, group of speakers um, that are coming up right now. Um, and first of all, I wanted to again thank all of our sponsors that contributed to this event. Um, on our terabit level, we had Comcast, Google Fiber, the Tonaquint Data Center, and Syringa. And then we had a gigabyte sponsor, CenturyLink, and a few megabyte sponsors, AT&T, which is, they're encouraging you to go to their um, texting and driving um, simulation up at their booth. Um, Beehive Broadband, and then RWMT is our other sponsor. We also wanted to thank um, some of our in-kind sponsors. Um, Emory Telecom is providing the camera crews for this event um, so that we can watch some of the, the sessions afterwards. And then um, we're very grateful to UPS for providing um, the accommodations for Todd Westberg to join us today. And then uh, the Schools Health and Libraries Broadband Coalition um, has flown out their executive director, John Winhausen, who will speak to us in a few minutes. And we appreciate um, they're, they're um, flying him out here for that. And then the Salt Lake Chamber has helped us marketing, with marketing some of the ad event. Um, so we thank them as an in-kind sponsor. So the flow of this afternoon of this session, um, I'm going to introduce Representative Steve Handy. And then Steve is actually going to take over as sort of a guest host for the afternoon, introducing a few of our other speakers. Um, and actually, Everybody um, that's speaking in this session has flown in from a different part of the country. We have a few people from DC. We have Chicago um, coming in. Did I miss Col Colorado? Um, so yeah, we're really grateful that we have some people coming in to join us today. Um, so I will first introduce Representative Steve Handy. Um, he was appointed by Governor Herbert in April 2010, and he's been reelected three times since then. His committee assignments include natural resources, environment, and agricultural and agriculture appropriations. Uh, many of you in the room are probably familiar with his work on the Public Utilities and Technology Committee. Um, and then he's also, he's the vice chair of that committee, and then natural resources, environment, and agriculture. So they're keeping him very busy. And he is also the chair of the House Ethics Committee, and professionally, he owns a public relations and marketing business, which he opened in, in 2002 after 17 years in newspaper marketing as the marketing director for both the Standard Examiner and the, and the um, Deseret News. So if you could join me in welcoming Steve Handy. Well, thanks very much. I'm really happy to be here. I flew in from Layton, you know, just flew down here, flew down the freeway. Actually. I was really grateful to get to past the point of the mountain, that nastiness, you know, and realize that one and a half billion dollar uh, investment that uh, the state has made in the freeways here in Utah County has really paid off. It's, it's really great. And we've had a lot of work done, uh, done in uh, my area of the woods in, uh, in, uh, in Davis County, but it's not quite like this. This is really terrific. So really, really great to be here today. I appreciate Kelly's invitation. So I was in the legislative session, and I was approached to help with uh, some, some, some legislation. Michael here from the Salt Lake Chamber and Kelly from GoEd and some others asked me if I would help with some legislation to create uh, this, 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 uh, this entity, our, our Broadband Outreach Center in the state of Utah. And uh, it, was, uh, it took a little doing to get it done. You know, we in, we in Utah are always a little bit skeptical of a new government organization. And, uh, but uh, when, when, when the communication was, was provided to legislators who are, who are certainly business oriented that how critical this infrastructure is and how far ahead we are in the state of Utah with, with what has been done, this became kind of a no brainer. So it's really great to, to see this, uh, this going forward. And Kelly was recently uh, in Washington and, uh, and got some plaudits uh, uh, her personally and as well as what, what the office has been doing in the way of broadband. Uh, just after the legislative session, I had the opportunity to go to uh, Chicago for the big technology and broadband conference there, and uh, they had for legislators something called the Cable Academy. So we had about two or three days and just immersing ourselves in, in, in legislative issues and, and uh, broadband issues around the, 
the, uh, the, the country. And, and just one of the little takeaways before I introduce our speakers was this, that, they, that, that one of the speakers says, okay, I want you to count all of the devices that you and your family have, you know, smartphones, TVs, tablets, you know, whatever it is. He said there's about 5.7 devices per home. Well, I counted 12 in mine. And it was a really interesting exercise to see how, how technology is so critical to the way that we function in, 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 in every day, everything that we're doing. And uh, the other takeaway that I had, which you already know, is that, uh, that, that, that consumer demand is insatiable. It can't be satisfied, really, for technology and uh, speed and all of the things that go with it and innovation, and it's an exciting time to be here on uh, planet Earth, and it's especially a great time to be here in the state of Utah to see the innovative, great things that are happening, the collaboration that's happening between government and industry. We don't want government to be leading the way, leading the charge. We want government to be facilitating collaboration and communication, and that's what I believe is happening. I'm pleased to uh, introduce to you John Windhausen. There's an excellent bio, bio on uh, John in the program, but just to uh, review that. Uh, he's the executive director of the, uh, for, of the Schools, Health, and Libraries Broadband Coalition. He also represents a variety of nonprofit and commercial organizations through his consulting firm, uh, Telepoly Consulting. Prior to opening his consulting practice in 2004, he served for five years as president of the Association for Local Telecommunication Services, a trade association representing competitive local exchange carriers. From 87 to 96, he served as counsel and senior counsel to the U.S. Senate Commerce Committee, where he helped draft the Telecommunications Act of 1996. That's very, very interesting, John. He began his career at the FCC as a staff attorney in 84, and uh, he graduated from Yale uh, and, uh, and then UCLA School of Law. He lives with his wife and daughter in Bethesda. So welcome to Utah, John, and we'd be happy to give the podium to you. Thank you very much, Representative Handy. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. Um, I am going to try to use the clicker and see. Apparently, I turned it off. All right, so I see the problem. So I may have to go use the next slide also feature unless. Uh, oh, I see. Got it. OK, great. Thank you. Um, it is a great pleasure to be here with you in Utah, and I'm really pleased, especially uh, to be here at the invitation of Kelly Cole, who really, in my book, is a superstar. Utah is so lucky to have her, and I say that, uh, I can give you one example of many, but uh, the, the, the White House meeting that uh, Representative Handy mentioned and Kelly attended, um, so I was at that meeting too, and, and somehow Kelly, it, it was a big meeting, of, hundred people or so in this room, somehow Kelly was able to snag a seat right front and center of this meeting and was called on several times to offer her views and volunteered her views even when she wasn't called on a few times. So you have really a great advocate for Utah uh, here and I, it's a great pleasure to know that uh, Utah is a member of the Shelby Coalition as well. So it's a real uh, privilege for us to have her contribute on our calls and be a part of our organization. And I look forward to working with all of you as well. So a little bit more about the uh, Shelby Coalition. As the name says, we're, we're at the Schools, Health, and Libraries Broadband Coalition. That is a mouthful, so we've shortened it to the Shelby Coalition. We are a 501 <coughs> nonprofit 501c3 organization. We were founded six years ago uh, in 2009, actually right after the stimulus bill passed Congress, uh, because we wanted to support the idea that anchor institutions ought to be uh, front and center of any broadband reform programs. And we were very much uh, supported by the statutory language, which identified anchor institutions as some of the key beneficiaries of this broadband rollout program. And we wanted to make sure that NTIA carried through and RUS which also got some of that broadband funding. We wanted to make sure that these two government agencies uh, fulfilled the statutory mandate. And it's, it's, it's enormously pleased to see that NTIA has done just that. Uh, these two gentlemen are, have done a fabulous job with NTIA. They're not the only ones that have done that. There's a whole large team at NTIA that has done a tremendous job. 25,000 community anchor institutions, over 25,000 community anchor institutions have been connected 
with high-speed broadband as a result of that BTOP program. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but that's just one of the benefits of the fact that the anchor institutions themselves have been connected. So we've been very happy with the, the progress that has been made. Having said that, our count is that that's about 10 percent, maybe 10 to 12 percent of all the community anchor institutions around the country. So as great as that progress has been, there also needs to be much more progress because the benefits of these broadband technologies at this stage have not been evenly distributed. And there's more work to do, especially in rural areas, to make sure that the schools and libraries and health clinics get the connections that they need so that they can be full participants in the United States economy and actually benefit from broadband. So as you can see here, our mission is to promote open, affordable, high-capacity broadband. The reason, one of the other reasons that Shelby Coalition was created six years ago is that uh, oftentimes in policy making deliberations, uh, policymakers tend to divide the world between business and residential. And the community anchor institutions are the critical third ingredient that often get left out of the calculation. So our role in the Shelby Coalition is to be a voice for anchor institutions to make sure that they are given the credibility and the visibility that they need to be equal participants in any broadband rollout plan, any broadband development plan. Anchor institutions are like the third leg of a stool of a healthy broadband community, a healthy ecosystem, and they need to be front and center in these, in these plans as well as uh, residential and business. So uh, I'm going to talk about a few of these. I, I will try not to repeat some of the information that I gave in the uh, uh, breakout session earlier today uh, and move on, but I will touch on a, just a couple of things here. Probably the most important that uh, some of which you've uh, heard about is the fact that there are so many uh, communities that uh, schools and libraries that are doing extraordinarily uh, innovative things uh, with this broadband. And I will say that even though we talk a lot about broadband, in my view, broadband is the facilitator, right? We talk about revolution. There, were, there was talk in the presidential debate last night about different kinds of revolutions. I really think the revolution in technology uh, has just begun uh, because it's not at the end of the day the technology itself that's the answer to our issues, it's what you can do with this technology. And when you go to schools now, you, you see just the beginnings of how schools are being able to incorporate one-on-one -on -one learning devices inside the classroom. They're developing new content uh, to, make thing, to make the technology more widely available. Uh, schools are doing such things as deploying Wi-Fi on buses. Uh, and parking those buses in the community so that students can have access to the internet even when they're home and they're not in the school. Um, in Kent, Washington, they're deploying kiosks, Wi-Fi kiosks in public housing. Again, so the students don't have to lose their internet connectivity when they go from the school to their home. Uh, the, the city of Houston is doing an enormously valuable, huge broadband project where they're kind of doing the reverse of the traditional model. They're buying or they're, they're purchasing and uh, uh, implementing uh, their own fiber networks and they're leasing the equipment. They decided to go with uh, not, la not tablets but laptops because it's a better uh, communications tool, it's a better educational tool. And so they're building their own broadband infrastructure, they're leasing the equipment um, in order to, but most important of all, they're providing the, the teacher training that's needed to really make sure that this technology is not just furniture. There needs to be a way to make sure that the teachers and the whole staff can integrate the technology, integrate the software and the educational learning so that it's actually valuable. We don't want just technology to be there. Our measure of success should be how well our, our kids are going to be educated. And that should be the end goal that we're just beginning to realize now how these technologies can be useful to produce smarter kids and kids with the technological skills so they can get jobs and they can be productive members of our economy. It's very interesting to see what libraries are doing as well with maker spaces. I don't know if how many of you have seen these, but libraries are increasingly dedicating portions of their space in the library just so that students and, and people of all uh, uh, ages can go in and create their own technologies, build, create their own software, create their own games, create their own uh, movies uh, and distribution products for uh, uh, media for distribution on the internet. Uh, it's incredibly exciting and so you see even though this started in the libraries, now schools are beginning to incorporate maker spaces as well into the school environment. 
So this is a trend that began in the libraries, but it is growing to the schools and perhaps other anchor institutions as well. And just as a footnote, uh, I'm very pleased, I think we've worked this out, Donna, that yes, we're, we're good. So I'm going to get a chance right after this session today to, to go up to Park City to visit one of the newest libraries that um, has been built there in Park City that is incorporating a makerspace environment that is really going to be great. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, so this is going to be a great trip for me in Utah for many reasons, not just here today, but for what we'll do afterwards. So I appreciate that opportunity. So what have we been doing? Well, one of the things that the Shelby Coalition is trying to do is to take all these great trends that are happening around the country and funnel them into the policymakers in Washington, D.C. So they have a better understanding of what they need to do and how our policies, technology policies, broadband policies need to be updated in order to further, and further the cause and advance the interest of community anchor institutions as we're trying to take advantage of this technology. So the E-rate program changes last year were a tremendous boost. Uh, we got a, an additional $1.5 billion into the E-rate program every single year. Uh, and a lot of that money is going for Wi-Fi in the schools and libraries. And it's also going to enhance fiber build out. Now the E-rate program for the first time is going to allow dark fiber to be eligible for E-rate support and the electronics to go with that. Not that every school and library is going to do that, uh, it, it is uh, costly, it is, there's a lot of work to do to build your own and deploy your own fiber network, but it gives schools and libraries an additional option. And we hope that this encourages the private sector to be more, more responsive to the needs of anchor institutions. In, in several states around the country, uh, schools and libraries put out bids for uh, broadband service, for, for high capacity broadband service, and they don't get any bids back, or they may only get one bid back. There has not been enough competition for broadband services serving our sector. So we're very hopeful that the FCC's new E-rate changes are going to uh, break the mold and stimulate even greater investment in broadband for schools and libraries. Uh, I just mentioned the FCC has loosened up those fiber deployment rules. Those are going to take effect next year, uh, but there's already work being done now to encourage applicants to seek those. In fact, the FCC has hired an, a consultant uh, just to work on uh, educating schools and libraries how they can pursue this option, and there are something like 70 or 80 fiber build projects in the works. Uh, I mentioned that another key component of the FCC's activities has been to encourage more responsiveness to these RFPs. So a really good thing that the Shelby Coalition asked the FCC to do four years ago, the FCC finally did at the end of last year, and required recipients of Connect America Fund uh, money, they now have an obligation to respond to an RFP for a school and library in the E-rate program. So that is a very useful uh, development. On the healthcare field, uh, this is an area of frustration for us and I think for the FCC as well. The FCC uh, under statute has an obligation to provide greater funding to help promote build out of greater broadband for health clinics. And that program just hasn't worked very well yet. They are, FCC adopted reforms in 2012. Those reforms haven't quite worked out the way we'd like them to. Still, only half of the money has been given out. The FCC has allocated $400 million per year. They've only been able to award $200 million of that. So the Shelby Coalition is uh, going to be filing a petition with the FCC um, uh, next month in order to increase, to change the rules, encouraging the FCC to loosen up that funding, reduce the size of the match. Hopefully we can stimulate the same kind of progress on the healthcare side that we've been able to do on the E-rate side. So, and if any of you are looking uh, or in, in interested in following and working with us on that petition, we would welcome your interest. I've had a lot of conversations with the Utah Telehealth, Utah Education and Telehealth Network and Ray Timothy. Uh, they're one of the co-signatories on this petition that we're going to be filing next month. Uh, and we're looking at uh, working with many others as well to get that done. So I did want to spend um, just a couple of minutes on open access. And I know this was touched on by the, the gentleman from NTIA. This is a really important concept, uh, building networks that are open to interconnection. Um, it's fascinating to me that how often you'll see a school network that is sole source just for schools or a health network just for health um, or, or a transportation network that is just for transportation and elsewhere. 
um, there is a tendency for each silo, each agency, each uh, type of industry to look at a network as if it has to be under their control and nobody else can use it. That is not the most efficient way to get broadband out. Uh, and now what we are seeing through the BTOP program encourages open interconnection and shared networks. Now we're, the FCC is making some moves in that direction with E-rate as well. But it's an enormously valuable concept and I think NTIA has said there are 800 interconnection agreements that have been signed. Most of those, if I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think most of those 800 agreements have been signed, with pri signed by private sector companies. So the private sector is, are the ones that are taking the best, most advantage of these BTOP builds. So this is another example of the private-public partnership that, and, and, um, uh, that NTIA has talked about for a long time, and Brian has talked about that as well. So the more we can the, use the government to stimulate greater investment by the private sector, that is a great thing for everybody. We've seen NTIA doing this, and now individual communities are beginning to adopt the same rationale, building off of those BTOP investments. I was in the uh, state of Maine a couple of weeks ago for another NTIA event, and they talked about how there are eight communities just in Maine that have plans now to build off of the three-ring binder uh, BTOP project in Maine to deploy broadband, last-mile broadband connectivity to serve the anchor institutions and the residential community as well. So it's a really fabulous way that the BTOP program, yes, the money was, is five years old now, but the effects of this investment that has been made are going to carry forward and are going to build for many years down, down the road, and I think it's a really exciting development. So um, lastly, I would like to just spend a couple of minutes on the Broadband Opportunity Council. Um, and, and I know Andy talked about this a little bit. I would just like to highlight a couple of items from this Broadband Opportunity Council recommendations. This is a really rich document for those of you who haven't taken a look at it. Uh, it's a very concise document, but still it has 36 different recommendations about how other federal government agencies, the actions they can take to incorporate broadband into their uh, portfolio of activities. You know, we, Shelby Coalition, has often said that broadband is not just an infrastructure, it's a meta-infrastructure. It helps all of the other infrastructures work better. And we're now seeing evidence that the Obama administration has really taken that idea and uh, is ready to take it to the next step by getting transportation and HUD and HHS and all the other federal government agencies involved in incorporating broadband into their agenda. Now, having said that, this is still going to be tough. This is not going to happen on its own. And these proposals that were contained in the Broadband Opportunity Council report are recommendations. These, each of these agencies now has to go through a notice and comment period in a lot of cases uh, in order to develop the recommendations and implement these recommendations. So the work is not done yet. In a way, these 36 recommendations, that lays out the agenda for the Shelby Coalition for the next year. Uh, these need support from all of you, from the private sector industry. Uh, the agencies need to continue to be here from us in order to be encouraged to say, yes, this is important. We need to pursue these initiatives. Um, just a few of them that I think are, are important. Uh, there are several uh, recommendations here that point out the need for anchor institutions to be involved, which of course is a great thing. Um, and they're inviting comment from all of us in order to try to implement those recommendations. So that's why we're prepared to do this. Um, there are a lot of talk, as you can see here, about future-ready schools. There's been some work on this already. There's a research agenda. Uh, they're going to conduct an inventory of broadband infrastructure around the country. Uh, let's see. Well, I may have just lost the slide. Sorry about that. Um, but, but I will say in a closing comment that the Broadband Opportunity Council is really lays out the agenda for the next year or two. We need, we've made some great progress with the BTOP program. We've made some great progress with E-rate. We haven't fulfilled our ultimate goal. The National Broadband Plan issued by the FCC five years ago called for all community anchor institutions to have one gigabit broadband capacity by the year 2020. We issued a progress report earlier this year in March, uh, five years out, and said, yes, we've made enormous progress. We've got a lot more progress yet to go. 
we've, in some ways, we've accomplished the easy half. So half of our goal has been accomplished, but the second half is going to be so much more uh, time consuming and so, going to require so much more energy, particularly to get broadband out to these rural schools, these rural uh, healthcare clinics, these rural libraries, and other anchor institutions. So we really look forward to your help uh, in working with us as we try to work with the, the, the Obama administration and work with state governments in order to accomplish these goals. Uh, if any of you would like more information about the Shelby Coalition, our website is shlb.org. If you're interested in joining with us, uh, we have membership opportunities available to you. But based, mainly what we want is to see broadband spread and the investments made across the country so that everybody benefits and we make this country an even stronger place to work, place to live, place to enjoy our lives and develop the economic growth that we need for the future. So thank you all for the opportunity to be with you today. Thanks.